Hello everyone, I'm Brazen Eagle, and thank you for joining me here. So, today. Today begins the start of a new series for us. I will read and discuss important information from this essay called The Fate of Empires and Search for Survival. If you haven't heard of this essay before, it details common themes that occurred through some of the most powerful nations in the history of the world including nations such as the Babylonian Empire, such as the Empire of Spain, and perhaps even a little bit of the French Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and things like that. But with this reading, I will break up the entire essay into smaller parts and find similarities or commonalities with the present nature of my country, the United States of America. So, if you want to read it for yourself, I have it linked in the description below. So, let us begin. So, I guess this just opens up with Sir John Glubb, who was the author. Uh, John Bagot Glubb was born in 1897, his father being a regular officer in the Royal Engineers. At the age of four, he left England for Mauritius, where, which is Africa, where his father was posted for a three-year tour of duty. At the age of ten, he was sent to a school for a year in Switzerland. These youthful travels may have opened his mind to the outside world at an early age. He entered the Royal Military Academy in Woolwich, he's English or British at the very least, in September 1914, and was commissioned in the Royal Engineers in April 1915. He served throughout the First World War in France and Belgium, being wounded three times and awarded the Military Cross. In 1920, he volunteered for service in Iraq as a regular officer, but in 1926, resigned his commission and accepted an administrative post under the Iraq government. In 1930, however, he signed a contract to serve the Trans-Jordan government, now known as Jordan. From 1939 to 1956, he commanded the famous Jordan Arab Legion, which was in reality the Jordan Army. Since his retirement, he has published 17 books, chiefly on the Middle East, and has lectured widely in Britain, the United States, and Europe. Alright, so, and there's a little thing right there. Cool. So, it's an introduction to this essay. So, as we pass through life, we learn by experience. God, is that true or what? We look back on our behavior when we were young and think how foolish we were. In the same way, our family, our community, and our town endeavor to avoid the mistakes made by our predecessors. The experiences of the human race have been recorded in more or less detail for some 4,000 years. If we attempt to study such a period of time in as many countries as possible, we seem to discover the same patterns cons constantly repeated under widely differing conditions of climate culture, and religion. Surely, we ask ourselves, if we studied calmly and impartially the history of human institutions and development over these 4,000 years, should we not reach conclusions which would assist to solve our problems today? For everything that is occurring around us has happened again and again before. No such conception ever appears to have entered into the minds of our historians. In general, historical teaching in schools is limited to this small island. We endlessly mule over Tudors and the Stuarts, famous families, groups in English history, the Battle of Creasy and Guy Fawkes. Perhaps this narrowness is due to our examination system, which necessitates the careful definition of a syllabus which all children must observe. I remember once visiting a school for mentally handicapped children. Our children do not take examinations, the headmaster told me, and so we are able to teach them things which will be really useful to them in life. However, this may be the thesis, which I wish to propound is that priceless lessons could be learned if the history of the past 4,000 years could be thoroughly and impartially studied. In these two articles, which first appeared in Blackwood's magazine, I have attempted briefly to sketch some of the kinds of lessons which I believe we could learn. My plea is that history should be the history of the human race, not of one small country or period. So, basically, to better examine ourselves... We must take an unbiased view of the present state of the people and nation. Now, this can be difficult, but only then can we learn objectively and examine and make our situation better. Sir John Glove makes a good point in learning the history of the human race so that we all learn and not make the same mistakes. Now, I say we learn from everyone's mistakes and make ourselves the best. Now, let us go on into his fate of empires. So, learning from history. The only thing we learn from history, it has been said, 
is that men never learn from history, a sweeping generalization perhaps, but one which the chaos in the world today goes far to confirm. What then can be the reason why, in a society which claims to be probe, or which claims to probe every problem, the bases of history are still so completely unknown? Several reasons for the futility of our historical studies may be suggested. First, our historical work is limited to short periods, the history of our own country or that of some past age, which for some reason we hold in respect. Second, even within these short periods, the slant we give to our narrative is governed by our own vanity rather than by objectivity. If we're considering the history of our own country, we write at length of the periods when our ancestors were prosperous and victorious, but we pass quickly over the shortcomings or their defeats. Our people are represented as patriotic heroes, their enemies as grasping imperialists or subversive rebels. In other words, our national histories are propaganda, not well-balanced investigations. I guess basically what he's saying is the victors write the rule books or the history books. Third, in the sphere of world history, we study certain short, usually unconnected periods which fashion at certain epochs has made popular. Greece 500 years before Christ and the Roman Republic and early Roman Empire are cases in point. The intervals between the great periods are neglected. Recently, Greece and Rome have become largely discredited, and history tends to become increasingly parochial history of our own countries. To derive any useful instruction from history, it seems to me essential, first of all, to grasp the principle that history, to be meaningful, must be the history of the human race. For history is a continuous process gradually developing, changing, and turning back, but in general moving forward in a single mighty stream. Any useful lessons to be derived must be learned by the study of the whole flow of human development, not by the selection of short periods here and there in one country or another. Every age and culture is derived from its predecessors, adds some contributions to, of its own, and passes it on to its successors. If we boycott various periods of history, the origins of the new cultures which succeeded them cannot be explained. Physical science has expanded its knowledge by building on the work of its predecessors, and by making millions of careful experiments, the results of which are meticulously recorded. Such methods have not yet been employed in the study of world history. Our peaceful historical work is still mainly dominated by emotion and prejudice. So, and that was merely part one. So, the first pillar of Sir John Glubb's essay is very similar to his introduction. We must learn about the history of the human race and see the items that make us successful, and what makes us fail? He stresses the point that while we can enjoy learning about our own history, we can become clouded and biased that can skew the way we see things. Now, I'm not saying that we should not feel good about our own history, but we must connect the dots which has led us to our present day. But why am I bringing up learning about the human race in support of Globe's idea? This is because, in my opinion... The United States, the current sole superpower of the world in 2019, is in decline. If we choose to not learn from history, all history, then we will be much like the other empires that came before us. You know, dead without even realizing it. I want to avert the death of my country at the very least. Be but if the United States falls, then the rest of Western civilization would not be able to stand alone and continue, at least in my opinion. So, let us move on to part two, the much greater and more impactful part of this part of the video. So, the lives of empires. If we desire to ascertain, or ascertain, I mean, the laws which govern the rise and fall of empires, the obvious course is to investigate the imperial experiments recorded in history and to endeavor to deduce from them any lessons which seem to be applicable to them all. The word empire by association with the British Empire is visualized by some people as an organization consisting of a home country in Europe and colonies in other continents. In this essay, the term empire is used to signify a great power, often called today a superpower. Most of the empires in history have had or have been large land blocks almost without overseas possessions. We possess a considerable amount of information on many empires recorded in history and of their vicissitudes 
and the lengths of their lives, for example, which I will come back to this chart, check it out right now, but I will come back to this pretty quickly. This loss calls for certain comments. Number one, the present writer is exploring the facts, not trying to prove anything. The dates given are merely, largely, arbitrary. Empires do not usually begin or end on a certain date. There is normally a gradual period of expansion and then a period of decline. The resemblance and the duration of these great powers may be queried. Human affairs are subject to many chances and it is not to be expected that they could be calculated with mathematical accuracy. Nevertheless, number two, it is suggested that there is sufficient resemblance between the life periods of these different empires to justify further study. Three, the division of Rome into two periods may be thought unwarranted. The first, or Republican, period dates from the time when Rome became the mistress of Italy and ends with the ascension of Augustus. The imperial period extends from the ascension of Augustus to the death of Marcus Aurelius. It is true that the empire survived nominally for more than a century after this date, but it did so in constant confusion, rebellions, and civil wars, and barbarian invasions. Not all empires endured for the full lifespan. The Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar, for example, was overthrown by Cyrus after a duration, a life duration, of only some 74 years. 5. An interesting deduction from the figures seems to be that the duration of empires does not depend on the speed of travel or the nature of weapons. The Assyrians marched on foot and fought with spears and bows and arrows. The British used artillery, railways, and ocean-going ships. Yet... The two empires lasted for approximately the same periods. There is a tendency nowadays to say that this is the Jet Age, and consequently, there is nothing for us to learn from past empires. Such an attitude seems to be erroneous. Number 6. It is tempting to compare the lives of empires with those of human beings. We may choose a figure and say that the average life of a human being is 70 years. Not all human beings live exactly 70 years. Some die in infancy, others are killed in accidents in middle life, some survive to the age of 80 or 90. Nevertheless, in spite of such exceptions, we are justified in saying that 70 years is a fair estimate of the average person's expectation. And number 7 is broken even further down into more parts. We may, perhaps, at this stage be allowed to draw certain conclusions. A. In spite of the accidents of fortune, and the apparent circumstances of the human race at different epochs, the periods of duration of different empires at varied epochs show a remarkable similarity. Immense changes in the technology, B, of transport or in methods of warfare do not seem to affect the life expectation of an empire. C, the changes in the technology of transport and of war have, however, affected the shape of empires. The Assyrians marching on foot could only conquer their neighbors, who were accessible by land. The Medes, the Babylonians, the Persians, and the Egyptians. The British, making use of ocean-going ships, conquered many countries and subcontinents, which were accessible to them by water. North America, India, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. But they never succeeded in conquering their neighbors, you know, France, Germany, and Spain. But although the shapes of the Assyrian and the British empires were entirely different, both lasted around the same length of time as told by this chart. So, Glob, Sir John Glob here, makes fascinating truths come out. Most empires or superpowers last for around 200 to 250 years. Obviously, from his chart, the shortest one is Persia from 208 years, Assyria 247 uh, Greece, 231, the Roman Republic, 233, Roman Empire, 207, the Arab Empire, 246, Mamluk Empire, 267, the Ottoman Empire at exactly 250, as well as Spain, the Romanov Russia, 234, with Britain at the time of you know this writing is also at 250. So, very interesting. And you know what? He goes even further and states that regardless of fortune or misfortune, the periods of duration are strikingly similar. Now, I'm only going to go over these two pillars in this video, but we're not just done yet. Let's get back, of course, to examine this chart a little bit further. So we can deduce, like I said, that most superpowers, regional powers, like mega powers, last for 200, 208 maybe, but to 250 years. Now, just because a country is a superpower during a specific time, 
it does not mean that the country is just immediately dead and cast away. For example, the Ottoman Empire here. It is started its superpower age in the 1320s, yet it stood until the end of World War I. It says here on the chart 1320 to 1570, but it stood until the end of 1918. Now, the country of Britain was obviously around for centuries before its golden era, beginning in 1700, but it, it itself is still around today, at least for now. But of course, in my opinion, the UK, the United Kingdom, is a shell of its former past. While it does have some nominal power, it pales in comparison to once to what it once had. But, you know, that's just my opinion. Regardless, I want to compare this to the United States. Now, like I said earlier, it is in my opinion that the United States is dying. People are becoming more and more divided and are replacing the values that once made the country great. The debt of the United States, I checked this before I even started doing this, at least at the timing of this recording, is the highest it has ever been with no signs of slowing down or anyone trying to be fiscally responsible for it. At this current moment, it's about $22 trillion in debt. At least the government is. Socially, here in the States, people are trying to tear each other down and claim to be the most victimized and oppressed groups in order to secure, guess what? Power and money. Physically, men have lost more and more of their own masculine presence and literal physical definition. From this article from Esquire.com, basically it's summed up as that with the current and continuing generations of men, or males, their ability to grip and pinch things has steadily declined. We men are becoming physically weaker than the generations before us. But, but, what can be done? Now, for the United States, where we began and end as a superpower has yet to be seen, but if we want to take the date of the beginning of the United States. So let's say 1776. In 1776, I wouldn't say we would be a superpower, but it gives us a good starting date. So we have 1776, and we use the two and a half centuries rule here. That means by 2026, we would not be considered a superpower. Now, math doesn't explain everything, but we are within right now, the very time frame of which we lose our superpower status. So, and this is why I bring this up. But, because of this information, or with this information, what can be done? Now, if you take a quick look at the chart, we see an exception. A radical exception, or really an extension, to the rule of this graph. By no means is this a perfect synopsis, but look at the words Roman. Look at it. Roman Republic, Roman Empire. In it, the Roman people survived the destruction of the Republic and eventually blossomed into the Roman Empire. Now, it is interesting to note that the year 27 BC was the turning point that made Rome eventually become even stronger and stronger. What happened in 27 BC? So, from Wikipedia. Year 27 was either a common year starting on Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, blah, 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 blah. But really, what happened in this year was the transition of the Republic to a stable empire with the ascension of Gaius Julius Caesar Octavian becoming Roman consul for the seventh time and basically becoming the first Roman emperor. This ushered in an era what we call Pax Romana, or a long period of hegemonial peace and stability, which still had wars, but it was a pe period of stability that was embraced by the Romans. Hmm. This was the only exception to the chart within of what John, Sir John Glubb gave us. There might be other countries like this, but this is what the material we have to work with. This is the only exception to the graph in which that's in which the Roman civilization survived and went on to conquer and make the known world at that time great. It is with this knowledge that we too can return America and, for the most part, the rest of Western civilization 
to be the greatest it has ever been. Now, I like to emphasize the United States, because mostly because I'm from the United States, but if America becomes its successful and super great again, then other nations, such as Australia and Germany, can make themselves great as well. But how do we do this? How can we reverse course? What happened to turn the Roman Republic, which was in decline, into an empire? Now, this is an extremely quick summary, and probably not the best summary you could find, but at least for the transition between the Republic to the Empire, you got to understand that the Roman Republic, by the year 27 BC, became extremely or very aristocratic and corrupt, especially in the decades before the change in government. It was very, very corrupt because of the pursuit of power that individuals so desperately wanted within the Republic They used their influence and money to obtain power. More and more power. That's all what it always comes back to is power, power, power. And this is where a guy named Julius Caesar comes into play. Because of his influence and popularity, the Senate, the Senate of Rome, and prominent aristocrats, which included senators, saw Julius Caesar as a threat to their own power and demanded that he come to Rome undefended without his armies to be cast away and destroyed so that the aristocracy could keep and maintain unlimited power, basically. Caesar decided this. He decided to come to Rome with his army and eventually crushed those who wanted him gone. Now, because of this, there were two decades of revolts that happened and civil wars, which ended with the rise of Gaius Julius Caesar Octavian becoming the emperor, and this spawned the era of Pax Romana. We too can do the same thing in in the United States. We can stop the decline of our country and instead reverse course to become the masters of the world. History proves that it is possible. It isn't easy. But it is possible to stop the decline of your civilization. It is completely possible. Very difficult to do, but possible. We can become strong leaders of the world once again if we choose to do so. We, but if we choose to do it, we must act upon it. I'm not saying, though, hear, hear me out for this. I'm not saying that we need to become a dictatorship for the rest of the United States' life, but... Without a strong, bold leader who understands history, and as much history as possible, we will fall like the other nations before us without a rebirth of our country. we got to understand history so that we don't make the same mistakes. It is possible to be reborn like a phoenix and turn the world into our oyster. It is possible, but that is everything for this video. I will continue to do this series in the coming weeks and months when I find more and more time and if it's a slow news day. So anyways, with that in mind, thank you very much for watching guys. I hope you learned something here today. I hope you inspired maybe to read this essay. It's a very, very good essay. I read it in two sittings. But I'm Brazen Eagle and I hope you have a great day.